A few months ago, my wife was digging through an old closet in the basement, pulling out boxes and trying to consolidate things to keep and things to get rid of. And one of these boxes was essentially a time capsule to my childhood. When I opened it up, there was a baseball mitt, there were cards and old photos. There was even the lyrics to a rap song I had written at some point in my childhood. And I promise you, the lyrics were better than any SoundCloud rapper out there today. But I digress. There was also a binder. And in this binder was an old elementary school assignment. It was a report I had written on the great state of Alabama, where my mom and half of my ancestry is from. And it talked about everything from agriculture to red diamond tea. And there was even this section honoring the great George Washington Carver. But it was only a few paragraphs. And essentially, George Washington Carver has been reduced to a man who did some really cool stuff with peanuts. What if I told you that your life right now is worth noticing. This is the Attention Collection. I'm Anthony Garcia. George Washington Carver was born in 1864. He was enslaved, along with his mother and brother, and forced to live on the Carver farm in Diamond Grove, Missouri. When George was still a baby, he and his mother were kidnapped. Eventually, George was recaptured, and I say recaptured because it isn't exactly rescue when you're dragged back to the place that first held you as property. But his mother was never seen again. And just one year later, slavery was finally outlawed in the United States. After that, George and his brother are essentially adopted by the Carver family, and they're taught to read and write. And through sheer force of will, George rises above his station. He defies all odds and eventually develops into the highly educated African-American scientist we see in the textbooks, at least those that honor his name. And there's this famous scene where he stands in front of the Congress in 1921. And he's been asked to appeal on behalf of the peanut industry. And they give him 10 minutes. And this room full of white guys essentially sits back with their arms folded, waiting to roll their eyes. But George Carver wows them. And so graciously, they decide to give him more time. And he displays his credentials. He presents his position. He's knowledgeable. And when it's all said and done... The white guys are thoroughly impressed. His position is passed and he forever becomes known in the annals of American history as the Peanut Man. He was already a notable figure. He already stood out in many ways, but after this event, he becomes something of a celebrity. And after his death, After all of his achievements, they build a monument in his honor, something unprecedented for a non-president, let alone a person of color. He was an incredible human being, and there's a good chance you just think he invented peanut butter. He didn't. This is actually the unfortunate side of history class, period. People are reduced to bullet points and highlight reels. Um, is this going to be on the test? And this is especially true for African American and indigenous people's history. On some level, it's unavoidable. There's only so much class time, so much information that can be presented. But we end up missing the person behind the paragraph. Yes, George Washington Carver was an inventor an agriculturalist who built his legacy on legumes, but that doesn't do his story justice. In 1865, he was accepted to Highland College in Kansas, only to be turned away when he arrived for class. Why? Because he showed up black. 
He was the first black student to enroll at Simpson College in Iowa. And what did he study? Not peanuts. Art and music. He later transferred to Iowa Agricultural College, where he became the first black man to receive a master's degree and then teach at the school. He eventually moved on to work for Booker T. Washington at Tuskegee Institute in Alabama. And this is where I picked up his story for my elementary class assignment. And there he developed their agricultural department and he became a noted inventor. Much of his work, yes, centered around peanuts. But even this list, albeit impressive, is just more of a highlight reel. And that was just a short list. George Washington Carver was more than a peanut man. He was an environmentalist before it was cool. He promoted racial harmony. He even advised Mahatma Gandhi. He rose above his station, but he never forgot where he came from. In fact, he advised thousands of poor farmers on nutrition, plant health, and medical care. He traveled around with a cart that he invented that was essentially a display and mobile education center to help people better produce crops so that they could survive and so that they could rise economically to the challenge that they faced. He turned down the pursuit of patents and more money in order to dedicate his precious time to helping other people. He wanted to provide much needed support and education. And all of these accomplishments, all of these offerings, started as little seeds planted in a secret childhood garden. The other night before tucking my kids in for bed, I read them a book called The Secret Garden of George Washington Carver. It's a lovely little book that I recommend for your personal library. And it does a great job illustrating his challenges and his achievements, the ups and downs that made such a beautiful life. And it also showed how this great man's life didn't just blossom out of nowhere. As an insatiably curious child, Dr. Carter said he wanted to know the name of every stone and flower and insect and bird and beast. Unfortunately, there were no classrooms for people of color in the newly emancipated and yet still incredibly segregated South. But that didn't stop young George. Here's an excerpt from the book. George decided to create his own classroom in the woods and studied the subject he loved most, nature. And no matter how much people discouraged him, he wanted to plant flowers. It turns out George kept a garden, but he kept it a secret to avoid being teased or redirected to something else. It was his own private laboratory. And so as he learned how to protect flowers from the frost, he also learned to protect his own creative spark. As he discovered how seeds transform into beautiful flowers in the right conditions, he also began to transform himself. But his secret garden was doomed from the start because it didn't remain a secret and that was because of his generosity. It began to sprout as soon as he saw the beauty emerging right in front of his face. And so he began to care for other people's dying plants. Eventually, he became known as the plant doctor and he adopted other people's plants into his own garden. He became something of a mentor something of a source of wisdom even at his young age. George Washington Carver had a secret garden. I didn't know that when I sat down in elementary school to scribble down a few paragraphs in his honor. I just knew the Cliffs Notes, the familiar. So as I sat there reading that story to my children... I felt a deeper understanding and appreciation begin to form. Here's what I wonder. What if everyone has some kind of secret garden? Beautiful and vibrant. Some better tended than others, sure. Perhaps forgotten or neglected, but nevertheless worthy of care. Consider the people closest to us. We know the highlight reel. 
the familiar stories. We've given them nicknames. We categorize these people in our minds for what they're known for. We know them so well that perhaps we don't know them at all anymore. Or what about the people we judge because we think we know everything there is to know about them? They're typical. We've heard this song before. Yes, I'm nuanced. I'm complicated. I'm misunderstood and often unappreciated. That person is one-dimensional. She's a carbon copy. He's my boss, a co-worker, an annoying stranger in the line at the grocery store. I know everything I need to know in a moment just by looking at them? Or what about the people we idolize? Not because we know them so well, but precisely because we don't. We know the curated persona. It must be nice to be them. They're so accomplished. It seems so easy. Snapshots, filters, highlights, and blurbs. I don't know about you, but human connection for me can be very complicated. We become bored and indifferent. Conversations can stay in the shallow. We feel unseen by people who feel the exact same way. Or we assume we see people when we're only actually catching a glimpse. What if we went out on a limb and assumed everyone has a secret garden? Yes, like us, there are some weeds. There are some skeletons buried underneath. But a garden nevertheless... If someone comes along with a genuine interest, a real desire to connect, a need, the generosity and depth of relationship is just waiting to bloom. What if? This is particularly challenging for me. I can make snap judgments and assessments with the best of them. I can tune out, I can disconnect, but I don't want to live that way. I don't want those to be my encounters. I don't want those to be my relationships. I find it only appropriate to give Dr. Carver the final word here. He said anything will give up its secrets if you love it enough. Not only have I found that when I talk to the little flower or to the little peanut, they will give up their secrets, but I have found that when I silently commune with people, they give up their secrets also, if you love them enough. That's a big if, and it implies cultivation. It implies getting below the surface, digging down deep into the soil to notice that not only is your life worth noticing, not only is your life rich and meaningful and purposeful, but so is that person you love. So is the person that drives you crazy. And so is that person you find yourself indifferent toward. It's all in the art of paying attention.